Well, joining me now to discuss a number of things today, former newspaper editor she uh, Emily Sheffield, conservative commentator Esther Kraku, and royal commentator and former press secretary for our late great queen, uh, Dickie Arbiter. Welcome to all of you. Thank you. Dickie, let me start with you. Twelve years you were the press secretary for Her Majesty. This must have been for you personally a very long and sad and reflective ten days. It was long, it was sad, it was reflected. I didn't quite get my head around it until I saw the hearse leaving Balmoral Castle. And then again it hit me when the RF regiment pallbearers took it off the C-17 at Northolt Airport. There were several moments when I nearly lost it. Uh, I was working for an Australian channel mm. and um, uh, Ali... Uh, sort of grabbed my hand at one stage. Ali Langdon from the Ali Today Langdon, Show, yeah. yeah. She, she grabbed my hand because she saw that something was afoot. And I'm very grateful to her for having done that. And that was when the coffin was being lowered into the royal um, crypt at St George's Temple. Yeah, Temple. it was an incredibly poignant moment. I mean, yeah. that was the moment, really, I felt, of finality the final moment where we would ever see this Queen in any form. It was our final moment to say goodbye and yes. thank you, Your Majesty. Would um, she have been surprised by the sheer scale of outpouring of love and affection? Probably, not? yes, because every time there was a jubilee, she stood on that balcony and the crowd stretched all the way from Buckingham Palace back to Trafalgar Square, and it was huge, a million people, and she never quite believed it. I mean, it happened uh, mm. on her golden jubilee, her... her diamond and her platinum and it was something that she really didn't believe i mean she almost echoed the words of her grandfather george v the people love me um and what came to mind while while you were while you were talking is that george v was called grandpa england and i'd like to think that late queen was grandma england yes absolutely um emily a lot of issues coming out of all this one is this concept being put out that charles may want a sort of downsized coronation if that is true, what is your view of that? Well, I don't know what it's downsizing from, but... I, mean, I... I imagine, in other words, compare it to the Queen's, it won't be as lavish or ostentatious. As the Queen's when she was coronated, yes. not, not her funeral. Um, again, I'm not entirely sure how lavish it was, but I think we've just... It was pretty seen... lavish. It was, well, I, I think somewhere it. in yeah, the... Yeah, you saw it. Yeah, I saw it. I think somewhere I, in the I middle... Forget, Dick, you, you don't look as old as, <laughs> as I know you are. Um, well, there's an interesting question, isn't it? I mean, my gut feeling about this is if you're going to have a monarchy, do it properly. The great thing about the last 10 days was being able to show the world that nobody has anything anywhere like this. So if you start downsizing everything, you kind of end up where a lot of European monarchies went, which it becomes so downsized it becomes pointless. There are certain things in the service you've got to have. You've got to have the anointing, you've got to have the crowning. The crowning might not be the same as late Queen's, where the crown was... Uh, St Edward's crown was placed on a head. It might be raised over over King Charles's head and then placed on a cushion, a symbolic crowning. And there'll um, be two crownings because Camilla will be crowned the Queen Consort. She right? will be crowned the Queen Consort. You, you don't don't start chipping away at tradition. No, I don't think so. You know, no, the only thing I would warn, maybe, is when the Queen was coronated. This was a young woman, a yeah. very good-looking young woman, mm. who had it, the, the shock of her father's death meant that she was suddenly escalated yeah. to her role as running the monarchy, head of the monarchy. Charles is not going to have the same glamour. But isn't that even more reason and, to well, make no, it because, look as glamorous as possible? Well, yes, make it look glamorous, but be careful you don't overprint okay. it. OK, let's move to another, another ongoing running saw, Esther. We've talked about this many times. Meghan and Harry <laughs> can't be ignored again. Their friend Gail King, best friends with Oprah Winfrey, who of course actually was the enabler for a lot of this stuff. Are these people that... actually friends? Uh, are these the... people ever actually Well, Gail and Oprah are great friends, yeah. yeah. And the Sussexes are neighbours of Oprah, so yeah. they sort of, I think Meghan's hijacked them as friends as well. Um, here's the point though Gail King said on American television this morning that she believes nothing's really been resolved. Let's take a look. Big families always go through drama, always go through turmoil. It remains to be seen. Are they going to be drawn closer together or are they going to be drawn apart? I have no idea. I have no inside information on that. But I will tell you this. It was good to see Harry standing with his family. I mean, it was, but I'm not sure anything got resolved. Yeah, I think it's too early to tell. I think, obviously, everyone is waiting with bated breath over Harry's book, um, which mm. I really hope is not as sort of 
bombastic as we fear it will be. And obviously, you know, Megan's podcast, let's hope she doesn't say anything more egregious about her I mean, family. I read today, it's probably not true, but it was an interesting sort of take on it, that she's busy going through all the podcasts trying to remove anything that attacks the monarchy because she now knows how badly that would play. The problem they've got, uh, I think, Dickie, in this, is that that's really their only currency, which is worth all the money. They don't have any other currency. They've already rubbished the royal family. And how you pull back from that, I really don't know. You talk about reconciliation. There's a very wide chasm. There isn't mm. a bridge big enough yeah. to bridge right. that chasm. And William, I didn't see William give Harry a single glance the entire time they were seen in public, let alone Kate and... And Megan, it looked to me like they were putting this show on to, to, yeah. to do it for their grandmother and credit to them for being able to do that. But the enmity between them all is incredibly real. I mean, yeah, this is not I, invented by the media. I do think that King Charles and the Prince of Wales have done the right thing, which is to put the olive branch out, because yeah. they need to be the grown-ups in the room. Yes. Absolutely. Megan and Harry, like, bitching about the royal family, <laughs> they need to... They need to neutralise that, and they need to do it fast. Well, they need I to shut up, don't they? I, I, I mean, they just yes, need to... They, I, they left I, the country in duty for freedom. I think they've done right, the so first bit. So go and have bit. your freedom and privacy and shut up. I, I, do hope, I do hope they do reconcile because I think mm. it will be a positive thing for every, everyone. I would advise Meghan and Harry to find some sort of expertise, like, I don't know, get a degree in neurobiology or something. Because, <laughs> because when you're only relevant... I don't think Harry would go from, near neurobiology. You know, when your only relevance stems from being in the royal family, in Meghan's case, for yeah. two years, you, you kind of want a backup plan. Let, I think, unfortunately, think... Meghan is going to keep capitalising on what she's been capitalising on so far. Yeah. She's got a title, she's got a, a captive audience in the United States. I mean, her, the sus squad were tweeting in America that she was the only one <laughs> who shed a tear. Oh, no, I know, it's ridiculous. Um, let's turn to something happier, because I, I find there's a limited amount of time we can give them before everyone's spleen start to <laughs> vent. Um, the pallbearers, Dickie, I found unbelievably moving. I've been reading all about these pallbearers. Um, young men, the finest of this uh, first battalion, Grenadier Guards, were chosen for this duty. And, and flown he, in specially from Iraq. Flown in from Iraq in many cases. Many of them had done uh, war tours and so on. But they were chosen. I can't think of a more pressurised thing to do, actually, other than actually engaging in real war, than what these guys did. With the, you're right there. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, more urgent water, please, for Sheffield. <laughs> um, I can't think of a, of a bigger honour for these guys, or a bigger responsibility, or more stress to have a billion people around the world watching, as you are carrying a very... Four billion. Well, for, well I, I think that probably was an exaggeration, but the, the reality is a lot. And this is a very heavy coffin, and it's carrying the greatest monarch in history. The pressure not to make any mistake, enormous. They were completely faultless. And the country, I think, recognised that. My question is, should the country go further and recognise them with, with honours for what Absolutely. they do? Absolutely. Absolutely. So. Um, you know, honours have been given to people for lesser things. Mm. This was a great moment. It was a great moment in their lives, it was a great moment in our mm. lives, and it was a great moment for the royal family. Are we all they agreed on this? Yeah, absolutely. We all were just agreed. discussing backstage, weren't we, whether it went MBE, OBE, and you thought MBE. I yeah. think as a start, it's an MBE. I because agree. then they can lift up. Eight MBEs would be the least we can give them, and congratulations to them and to their families. It must have been bursting with pride, but imagine being the parent of one of those kids watching yeah. and thinking, please, don't yeah, let I, anything I, go wrong. You know? you, you're talking about the heavy, the heaviness of, of the coffin. Mm. An American tweeted me and said, what are they making so much fun? They're only carrying a box. I tweeted back and said, it's lead-lined. Yeah. Now go away. Oh, exactly, yeah. You get idiots on Twitter. You should stay off Twitter, Dickie. You're, you're far too venerable for that kind of behaviour. <laughs> no, I get um, annoyed. <laughs> Dickie, it's great to see you. I wanted to catch up with you, because I'm sure you've been through a lot of emotions in the last mm -hmm. uh, couple of weeks, and um, it's, it was a historic moment. I think the country did the Queen proud. The like country it. did the Queen proud. The, the people were magnificent. There was no angst in the queue. Not a few celebrities allegedly jumping the queue, but they were, they were all very friendly. They were all very relaxed. When somebody had to go out of the queue, perhaps to go to the loo or be interviewed on television, they got their place back in the queue. There was what? no squeezing up. You weren't impressed by the queue jumpers? No, not particularly. Mm. I thought David Beckham was brilliant, mm. queuing up for 14 hours. Yeah. We won't talk about the others. <laughs>